passengers are at life and death risk when planes are badly built. Hydraulics, we've lost it. When engineers make mistakes. This tragedy is not an accident. Seconds after takeoff, this plane flips out of control. This broke every rule in the book. Hidden errors destroy this jumbo jet. Every crash holds lessons that cannot be ignored. Somebody's got to stand up and say, come on, people, let's do the right thing. But some engineering solutions can lead to further unexpected problems. How does the aviation industry battle to eliminate engineering error? JFK Airport, New York. It's the end of a hot July day. TWA Flight 800 is waiting to depart for Paris. It finally takes off just after 8 o'clock in the evening. There are 230 people on board. Among them, Jill Zimkovitz is on her first overseas trip as flight attendant. Jill's brother, Matt, air safety campaigner. It was, um, you know, it was a regular day, it was a beautiful day, and Jill was so excited about flying to France that she was told everybody that she was doing it. In Jill's care is a group of 16 high school students from a small town in Pennsylvania. They're off to see the sights of Paris on the biggest journey of their lives. As they settle in, the plane climbs up towards its cruising height. Fourteen thousand feet above the Atlantic, TWA 800 and everyone on board is blown out of the sky. The plane's last moments were seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses. We saw a big giant ball of flames. Biggest orange ball I ever saw. My son was standing there on the beach and he said, oh look, and we saw an explosion. We turned and looked at what looked like fireworks that were in the sky. And I looked up and I saw what appeared to be a glowing ball. Jill's brother Matt remembers that dreadful evening. All of a sudden, we got word that there was a plane crash off of the coast of Long Island. And details were sketchy, and my mom was the first to hear. And I remember her curled up on the couch, and she knew. She, uh, she knew there was no hope. It started connecting that this was Jill's flight. This was, you know, TWA Flight 800. It happened. Flight attendant Jill's body is one of the first to be recovered. All 230 people on board the Boeing 747 are dead. Following the eyewitness reports, many suspect the plane was brought down by a missile or a bomb. The FBI tell the public it's terrorism. Uh, we know there was a catastrophic explosion. It's caused by some sort of a bomb, obviously. Uh, we're not further describing how that, where that would be, whether it was carried on or, uh, or something hit the plane from outside and caused it to explode. But the crash investigators need to be sure. They have a difficult, delicate task. 
First, they have to remove the victims' bodies. Then recover thousands of pieces of wreckage. Each one a potential clue. At 100 feet down, each diver can only work for a short time. After seven days searching, they find the plane's black boxes. Excuse us. Immediately, the investigators' hopes rise. Both voice and data recorders have survived the impact. About 11 and one half minutes after takeoff, the recording ended abruptly. That abrupt stop is a clear indication of a catastrophic event, but that was all the investigators could tell. The recorders appear to hold no further clues. To find out what happened to TWA 800, the crash investigators begin the painstaking task of reassembling key parts of the jumbo jet. An extraordinary 95% of the plane has been recovered. And soon, they can come to one definite conclusion. TWA 800 was not brought down by terrorists. Jim Wildey was the team's materials expert. It became pretty clear within the first month of the investigation, and even maybe sooner than that, that of all the pieces that were being recovered, not one single piece contained any evidence of a bomb or a missile. But now there's a new puzzle. If it wasn't terrorism, what has gone wrong with this plane? Investigators start the long process to establish the cause of the crash. Is it possible that a plane designed to be fail-safe could be the victim of engineering error? It's one of the man-made catastrophes of the modern world. Hundreds of lives lost, billions of dollars wasted, because a plane's not fit to fly, because of engineering error. But the need for safety has always vied with the need to make money. The boom in air travel triggers a boom in aircraft construction. And competition is fierce. Lockheed Martin, McDonnell Douglas, and the Boeing Corporation, all vying for the top spot. In 1970, McDonnell Douglas unveils its new star, the DC-10. After a billion dollars investment, they're convinced it's both safe and a future moneymaker. The DC-10 seems to be beautifully made. It handles well and is immediately popular with pilots. John Baines, DC-10 captain and former RAF fighter pilot. It's a huge aeroplane. You think it would be heavy to fly. It isn't. It's very light and delightful and fairly simple. I found it uh, my favorite aircraft that I, that I ever flew. Carrying over 250 passengers, the DC-10 is one of the new generation of big jets. Its major rival is Boeing's 747 Jumbo, but the DC-10 can use much shorter runways. American 340, turn right to 070, start to turn as soon as feasible, call departure. Hello, Roger, good to go. Bye-bye. The DC-10 appears to be a winner for McDonnell Douglas. Within three years, it's flying the busiest routes across America. But then, 
disaster strikes through engineering error. Springtime in Paris. At Orly Airport, father of five, Francois Drouin, is setting off on a business trip. His son, Bruno, was then just five years old. I remember that Sunday that we drove our father to Orly. My father was, was taking a plane to London for his job. He was working for an oil company. But Bruno's father's flight from Orly Airport has been cancelled because of a strike on a British airline. One of the only planes available is Turkish Airlines Flight 981, just arrived from Istanbul and on its way to London. It's a DC-10, just two years old. Because of this uh, unexpected uh, strike, many people uh, took that plane. And so for that reason, this plane was uh, full. The Turkish Airlines DC-10 is held in Paris, so it can take on passengers stranded by the strike. Unknown to his family, Francois Drouin also gets on board. Captains Ullusman and Burkos complete their pre-flight checks. At the back of the plane, Mohamed Mahmoudi, baggage loader, closes the cargo door. The DC-10 is finally ready to leave for London. Flight 981 is cleared for takeoff just after 12.30 in the afternoon. Everything appears normal. Until the plane approaches 12,000 feet. Gusts of cold air rip past the passengers. Cabin blew up. I can bring it up. She's not responding. Hydraulics? We've lost it. Watch all episodes of Ice Pilot. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Just outside Paris, the plane smashes into the ground at almost 500 miles an hour. All 346 passengers and crew are killed. Uh, it was a very, very violent impact. And the French authority, as well, were uh, not prepared for such an event. It was the first one. Bruno's family fear the worst for their father, but they still don't know whether he'd switched planes. The passenger manifest was not complete. So uh, when it happened, they couldn't get clear information. The proof of my father's presence in this plane was identified uh, through his wedding ring that had been found on a fragment of his hand, uh, and in which it was the, the date of the wedding of my parents and the first name of my mother. Bruno was just one of many children who lost a parent. So it, uh, it had an impact on me, but also on people around me. I, I, I didn't know when my first child came how a father is behaving, because I didn't see it. In 
In the aftermath, the French investigators begin the dreadful process of looking for clues amongst the wreckage. People who had to work there, all of them, had, had tremendous shock. Many of them reported that they couldn't do it so much or so long because it was uh, emotionally difficult. A uh, lot of uh, uh, fr human fragments almost everywhere. But then the investigators get their first major clue. 10 miles from where the plane came down, French police discover a macabre scene. Six dead passengers strapped into two rows of seats. Alongside them, a mangled piece of wreckage. It turns out to be the rear cargo door. The same door that had been closed just a few minutes earlier by baggage loader Mohamed Mahmoudi. But how could a door just fall off a plane? The answer would turn out to be engineering error. The investigators now focus on the issue of pressurization. Jet aircraft fly at high altitude, where the air pressure is very low. To keep the passengers comfortable, the interior of the plane has to be kept at a higher pressure. If the cabin was not pressurized, the passengers would be exposed to an altitude higher than Mount Everest. So it's crucial the DC-10's doors are designed to be airtight. During flight, the pressurized air inside the plane is pushing against the doors, trying to force them open. The large cargo doors which open outwards are particularly vulnerable. David Learmount is a pilot and an expert on aviation issues. These doors, of course, are very large. You know, they're very, very large doors indeed. So they, if they open in flight, you've got a hell of a big hole in the aeroplane. To prevent the cargo doors being blown open, the DC-10's engineers designed an elaborate locking mechanism. Pushing an external lever rotates claws on the inside, so they catch around a bar. It should have been totally reliable, but it was not. The design fault was this. You could actually um, operate the lever, and it felt as if it had locked, but it could have failed to lock completely. Investigators find that the door lever could appear to be properly closed, even though the locking claws were not being held in place. It's a clear example of engineering error. The investigators start to piece together an horrific chain of events. It all starts with the door's failing locking mechanism. Basically, they were doomed from that moment on, because, because when the cargo door blew out, uh, all of the air in the cargo hold beneath the cabin floor exited this very, very large hole. The blowing out of the cargo door was the first disaster. Then the pressurized air in the cabin also tries to escape to the outside, smashing a hole in the cabin floor. It's this violent rush of air which sweeps six passengers out of the plane to their deaths. Those were the six people found 10 miles from the main crash site, still strapped to their seats. The collapsing cabin floor leads to a further disaster. 
It destroys vital control cables. Hydraulics, we lost it. These cables work with hydraulic pressure to move critical parts, like the rudder and stabilizers. Without them, the pilots are unable to fly the plane. I can bring it up. She's not responding. So the pilots had no control over the airplane any longer. They literally couldn't tell the airplane any longer what to do. The equivalent in a car would be your steering and your brakes fail. There's nothing you can do. You can't direct the car, and you can't slow it down. Years later, in memory of all those who died, Bruno wants to find out the full story behind the crash that killed his father. From all the available evidence, it's clear to him that this wasn't an accident. It was caused by engineering error. For me, this tragedy is not an accident. Accidents, it's bad luck. Here we are in something else. It had been a combination of bad luck, but with absolutely uh, a known problem. Bruno finds out from an internal memo that even some of the engineers who built the DC-10's cargo doors thought they were unsafe. The product manager regarding the locking of the door made a report mentioning that this locking system was, was not very safe. And it was a risk that in the life of the plane, almost 20 years, some loss of planes and people. It's going to happen. Then Bruno learns that an American DC-10 had suffered exactly the same engineering error two years before his father died. The door blew out, the cabin floor collapsed, and vital control cables were damaged. But the pilots got lucky. It, it crimped the control cables, but it didn't cut them, and the pilots were able to nurse the aircraft back to a safe landing. So Bruno's father and his fellow victims didn't die just because of an engineering error. They died because of a known engineering error that no one had prevented. Eventually, the authorities act. All DC-10 cargo doors are fitted with a new lock and vents put in the cabin floor to stop it collapsing. But not all the lessons were heeded. It was the destruction of the plane's control system that had brought the DC-10 down. For the future, it had to be made fail-safe. So that even if one part suffered a catastrophic failure, the plane should still be safe to fly. But five years later, that failure to make it fail-safe would come back to haunt the makers of the DC-10, McDonnell Douglas. Chicago's O'Hare Airport. United 562, turn right, heading 070, call a departure today. The busiest in the world. He needs to make a right turn where you're at. Can you make a uh, left turn in there? On that day in 1979, it's even busier than usual. The military off his right side to go across yeah, the Yeah, I'm trying to get everybody out of here. It's the start of the Memorial Day weekend, and tens of thousands of passengers are trying to get airborne. An American Airlines DC-10 prepares to set off for Los Angeles. O'Hare ground, uh, United, American 191 for taxi. Line all three taxi in a position hold on runway 32 left from T1. Make a uh, left turn in there. At two minutes past three in the afternoon, the DC-10 is ready to go. Engine stable, take off thrust.
Powered by its three engines, the plane hurtles down the runway. Me too. Positive climb, gear up. Suddenly, the left engine breaks loose. Damn. Yeah, that airplane just lost the uh, engine here. It sounds catastrophic, but even losing an engine shouldn't have brought the plane down. DC-10s were designed to be able to fly on two engines. But then the plane starts to bank to the left. Oh my God! Something else has gone wrong. The pilots lose control. The DC-10 flips right over. All 271 on board are killed, as well as two people on the ground. It is the worst single aviation accident in US history. There are now two big questions. Why had the engine fallen off? And why had a plane designed to fly on just two engines flipped over out of control? Answering why the DC-10's engine fell off proves alarmingly simple. It's a case of poor maintenance. One of the attachments holding the engines in place had been cracked. And no one had noticed. Urgent checks reveal similar cracks in six other DC-10s. The concern is the entire fleet in America is now at risk. That's a frightening 138 aircraft. I have no choice but to ground all US DC-10s immediately. The blame for the cracks falls on the airlines not on the plane's manufacturers, McDonnell Douglas. But then the investigators discover another critical error. And that error has to do with fail-safe design. The idea that if there's a catastrophic failure, the pilot should still be able to control the plane. It all goes back to the moment when the plane banks to the left. That happens because the engine coming off ruptures vital hydraulic control lines operating slats on the wings. When the engine tore itself away from the wing, it destroyed the hydraulic system which kept those slats extended. When the slats retracted, because they had no longer hydraulic pressure to keep them out, that wing lost lift. Just like in the Turkish Airlines incident, the plane crashes because pilots lose control. The lesson of fail-safe construction has not been learned. That is not in the best traditions of aircraft design. Aircraft design is supposed to be based on what they call fail-safe. If it fails, the aircraft's still safe. This broke every rule in the book. Over the next few years, the DC-10's engineers do learn this lesson. They install mechanical systems to make the DC-10 safe but they can't patch up the plane's damaged reputation. Today's DC-10s are mainly used as cargo planes. It is Boeing 747 Jumbo that becomes the world's most successful passenger jet. Its engineers seem to have learned the lessons of fail-safe design. Until that July evening in 1996, when TWA Flight 800 blows up, killing all 230 passengers and crew.
After months of painstaking work, the crash investigators have reassembled entire sections of the shattered plane. With all the large number of pieces, thousands of pieces, they had to be pieced back together so that we could start to understand how the airplane came apart and then try to focus on why the airplane might have come apart. Once they'd ruled out the possibility of a missile or a bomb, they searched for the source of the explosion in the plane itself. Eventually, they find it. The central fuel tank has blown up. So what had done it? It didn't take long to identify the culprit. It was right there in the tank. Fuel vapor. When Boeing's engineers designed the 747 in the 1960s, the plane was expected to fly with all its tanks full. But when fuel prices rose, the airlines had to cut their costs. Christine Negroni has written extensively about TWA 800. As we started to get more concerned about our use of fuel in the 70s and the 80s, airplanes stopped flying with full fuel tanks. If they didn't need the fuel, the tank went empty. But investigators discover that flying with empty fuel tanks posed a risk that had not been fully recognized. On that July afternoon, TWA 800 is sitting out in the baking heat at JFK Airport. To keep costs down, its central tank has just a puddle of fuel in it. And when that fuel gets hot, it turns into explosive vapor. This situation is made far worse by a second engineering error. Directly beneath the fuel tank, Boeing's engineers have put the plane's air handling units. These provide filtered air into the passenger cabin. But while they're making the passengers comfortable, these units are also giving off heat. And that heat is going straight into the fuel tank. All there is is a puddle, and that puddle turned to vapor, and the vapor was explosive. The investigators now uncover a terrifying scenario. TWA 800 is climbing away from New York with a highly explosive fuel tank. The 230 people on board have no idea. It's like sitting above a bomb waiting to detonate. All it needs is a spark to set it off. But that's a risk Boeing's engineers thought they had eliminated. Their fail-safe design should have prevented it. They had made sure the only wiring allowed in the tank used a very low voltage. Not enough to cause the spark. Bob Swaim is a key member of the investigation team. He begins his hunt for the cause of the spark by taking another look at the cockpit voice recorder. We came to realize that some of the background noise dropped out. Well, the energy didn't just disappear. It went somewhere. Where the energy went was a short circuit, somewhere in the plane's wiring. And short circuits can cause sparks. But Bob Swain's still puzzled. There's only low voltage wiring in the fuel tank. Even a short circuit shouldn't have been powerful enough to create the deadly spark. Looking for an explanation, Swaim and his team sift through the vast extent of the plane's wiring. 
we examined 150 miles of wire from this one airplane, inch by inch. We would sit there on uh, uh, stools or whatever we could find, like little old ladies in a knitting circle, looking at wiring. What they find is some of that wiring is in a terrible state. And many different wires with cracked insulation are bundled together. And this was really important because you could have wires that were powering electric lights with over 150 volts laying next to wires that would go to a fuel tank, which should never have more than five volts. Swaim now realizes if the high voltage wiring is damaged, a dangerously high current could jump across into the tank's electrical system, causing the fatal spark. The investigation finally pieces together the sequence of engineering errors that brought down TWA 800. First, fuel vapor builds up in the tank. It's heated to a critical state by the air handling units. Cracked wires allow high voltage current into the tank. There's a short circuit, a spark, and the tragic result, is the second worst domestic air disaster in America. Every year, families and friends meet to remember their loved ones killed on board TWA 800. It ruined the family. It's not the same as it was. There's always something missing. But when it's coming to, to safety and you know human life, and people's lives, and potentially your children's lives, you can't put a price tag on that. And I think you know it's not so hard to do the right thing. And, and sometimes I think the airlines and industry and the engineers get wrapped up in statistics and numbers, and they lose lose the connection with people. But there is some compensation. Flight attendant Jill Zimkovitz and her fellow victims didn't die in vain. The authorities finally recognized the threat of exploding fuel tanks. With 1,200 other jumbo jets at risk around the world, they had to come up with a solution. New technology now replaces explosive vapor in the fuel tank with the inert gas nitrogen. Overall, other than complaining about the slow pace at which safety changes are made in aviation, I'd have to say Flight 800 has a good legacy. The TWA 800 investigation shows that a plane can have an excellent safety record until circumstances change. In the case of Flight 800, flying with an empty fuel tank exposes unforeseen risks in the plane's design. Aircraft engineers realize they have to get better at predicting problems. The type of engineering issue which happens now in a good airline with a, a, a modern airplane is the type of engineering issue that has not been foreseen. But is this going to be possible? In the 1990s, to minimize engineering error, Boeing begins using the very latest technology to design and build the 777, the world's largest twin-engine jet. Just like Boeing's original jumbo, it soon gains an impressive reputation for safety. David kaminsky morrow is an expert on aviation safety. 13 years up to January 2008, this aircraft had clocked up 14 million flight hours without a single one being lost in an accident. 
but there is a shock in store for Boeing's engineers. They may have dealt with the risks of fuel getting too hot, but they will fail to predict what can happen when fuel gets too cold. Heathrow Airport on a normal busy day. Planes from all over the world landing every three minutes on the southern runway. Among those on its way into Heathrow is a British Airways 777. Flight 38 has 136 passengers and 16 crew on board. They've been flying for 11 hours through the night from Beijing, and everyone is looking forward to the end of the journey. Captain Peter Burkill and First Officer John Coward prepare for landing. OK, you have control, John. I have control. Everything is pretty much normal, about a minute before the aircraft is due to touch down. Uh, it's at about 1,000 feet, the landing gear is down, the flaps are deployed at about 30 degrees. There's no indication there's anything wrong. Speedbird 38, clear to land, 27 left. Clear to land, 27 left, Speedbird 38. Then at about 500 feet, just 35 seconds from landing. I can't get power. Both engines suddenly lose power. The airspeed is starting to drop back. This 200-ton aeroplane is effectively turning into a glider. The passengers have no idea they could be about to die. And it could be even worse. Beneath them, there are tens of thousands of people at risk. Cab driver Johnny Rowland is on his way to pick up a passenger when the plane flies right above him. It was a noise that I hadn't heard before. It was a whistling noise rather than an engine noise. Just as I got to this, this point here, um, the, the, it's, the, the cab completely went dark with a shadow of, uh, around it, the whole area. And as I looked out the right-hand window, I saw the plane was so low to the fence, it could have only been 10 foot above the fence. And I said to myself, oh, you're going to crash. Mayday, mayday, speedbird. Incredibly, all the passengers and crew survived the crash with just a few minor injuries. The headlines are full of praise for the heroes in the cockpit. As captain of the aircraft, I am proud to say that every member of my team played their part expertly yesterday, displaying the highest standards of skill and professionalism. The engineers are now desperate to find out why those two engines lost power. A double engine failure is extremely rare. Soon the plane's data recorders point them towards a very new kind of engineering problem. Something stopped fuel flowing to the engines. But what? Something happened within the fuel system which had never been foreseen. Back at their base, the investigators reassemble the plane's system of fuel pipes, but they can't find any physical obstruction. That leaves one other possibility. Ice. The plane's route from Beijing took it through some extremely cold air, down to minus 74 degrees Celsius. At these temperatures, the minute amount of water contained in aviation fuel can turn to crystals of ice. 
had ice blocked the flow of fuel. At first, this seemed impossible. Ice is a well-known risk, and aircraft engineers thought they'd dealt with it. In the 777, they had made sure cold fuel is warmed up before it gets to the engine, in a device known as a heat exchanger. Steve Moss is a leading crash investigator and engine expert. Uh, as the fuel flows through these tubes, it, it is heated so that as it comes out at the end here, it is actually above zero degrees so that ice crystals are not fed down to the engine. So if this device was meant to melt any ice crystals, how could they have blocked the flow of fuel? The investigators then go back to the flight data recorders. They study what was happening in the fuel system during the long flight from Beijing. They then simulate the impact of cold weather on the fuel pipes. Well, the testing showed something which had not been taken into account. During cruise, when the fuel flow is pretty sluggish, ice can actually accumulate inside the pipes. So during the long journey, the investigators now think ice gradually builds up. OK, you have control, John. I have control. Approaching Heathrow, the pilots need more power from the engines. This sends a sudden surge of fuel through the pipes, dislodging the ice. And it becomes a sort of snowball, or, or more likely an avalanche, getting bigger and bigger. Uh, as it travels towards the engine. The snowball smashes into the heat exchanger and blocks it. Just as the plane needs more power, the fuel can't get past the ice. The engines are useless. The designers thought they'd thought of everything, but there was one circumstance they didn't even know could happen, and it zapped. Once again, it had taken a crash to reveal a problem the engineers had not foreseen. Now they know it can happen. It takes a very small alteration to the face of the heat exchanger to make sure even a sudden rush of ice can be melted. So what happened to BA Flight 38 is another stark reminder. It is the same lesson first revealed in the DC-10 crashes over 30 years before. Engineers have to plan for the unpredictable. They have to make the planes fail safe. Today's engineers continue to strive to build much safer planes, and there are far fewer accidents due to engineering error. Fatal accidents are six times rarer than they used to be 30 years ago. I mean, that is a quantifiable improvement. Massively improved reliability, engines, airframes, systems. But also, we've been learning lessons. The aviation industry is still young. Barely a century separates our modern jets from the first days of flight. For today's engineers, the challenge remains the same, to eliminate errors before they lead to disaster.